letting in people now yeah professor i think the participants it's open for the participants now okay so what we'll do is we'll just wait for a few more minutes before we begin sure give me some sort of an indication aditya when you think we could begin i mean when if you see participants are still coming in we'll we'll, we'll just wait um but if you see it's kind of more or less stopped and you know the numbers are stable then we we can start sure professor i'm just looking at the participants right now um i'll just tell you when we have a stable number okay and aditya i think uh, among the songs we'll only play the first one okay sure i have both the links opened up so when you yeah. instruct me i'll just yes Professor, I think we have a stable number of people. Should we should we start? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we should. Maybe we should start. Yeah. Um, um, thank you, uh, those who have come in on a Sunday evening to, you know, um, listen in on this conversation. 
Um, it it kind of uh, so happens that this is the first event um, presented by organized by the Center for the Creative and Critical uh, at Ashoka University, but it hasn't been flagged up as a launch event as such. Um, partly because it never really struck me until today that it was the first event. And that, that's partly because, you know, um, this is a continuation of conversations that, uh, you know, a, a group of us have been having. Uh, some, of, uh, some members of the group, um, you know, are just friends. Uh, some of them have been speakers at um, the symposiums organized uh, under the rubric of literary activism. Um, and some of them have maybe contributed to the website literaryactivism.com. Uh, so th this is only um, the latest in a series of conversations that began in December 2014 when the first symposium in, liter in the literary activism series happened. And the, the nature of the conversations have been to do with um, yeah, bringing together, uh, has to do with bringing together practitioners and people who are thinking about their own practice or others' pra practices. Um, so uh, a convergence of a background of practice and thought. Uh, and and uh, the, the reason for creating uh, a space for these conversations has been to do with the fact that there's been so little space for such conversations to happen. I mean, they don't happen, as I've said before, in academia. Uh, and... Um, they don't happen in the space um, in which you encounter practitioners. Um, so practitioners will speak about a particular um, bit of their practice, but maybe not reflect upon what it means to be part of that practice today. And, and, and uh, what possibilities and problems uh, being a, a, a practitioner today involves. Uh, but uh, one, one of the things that I think we um, accept is that there is no continuity in practice. We, we, we can't say that by inviting a, a dancer or a, an actor or a director or a novelist uh, you know, we have um, grasped, grasped what it means to, to sort of, you know, be in touch with somebody who writes novels or directs plays or, or acts in them. Um, because uh, what it means to do these things change all the time and they have changed radically in the time of globalization. Um, so to pretend that one is a novelist or a writer uh, without having to grapple with what that means today, every novelist, every poet, every writer, every pr practitioner must grapple with what that particular being that means. And, and I, I think that's true of the academic and the scholar. What does it mean to be a scholar in the humanities today um, without Addressing that bit of the question, I think, um, you know, we, we are idealizing the, the ways in which we actually exist. But, but the, 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 the questions to do with what is happening now um, and how we are getting our head around what we are doing now, because the, 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 the the sense of futility is with us always. The sense of pointlessness is with us always. It, what is the point of what we're doing? I mean, admitting to that opens up a whole set of questions. 
and and redefines what we are doing and this is this is partly what these conversations are meant to give space to uh, to allow these questions that are suppressed to 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 become part of uh, of the conversation um so today i'm uh, uh, delighted to have rustam barucha um who's a writer uh, a dramaturg he's written several books he's a cultural critic um he retired as professor of theater and performance studies school of the arts and aesthetics at jnu uh he's conceptualized uh new sorts of ideas for the museum um but he's also long been an independent i mean i think of him as an independent critic as i said to him today what, what is it that kind of marks you out in my head as as being an independent critic and therefore in a way um the kind of person uh, that one would like to talk to in this particular context to do with the creative and critical which itself as a as a rubric doesn't represent a particular department it's not the department of english it's not the department of creative writing it's not any other department or some branch within that department it's a non departmental entity uh, so it's nice to have somebody i think of as an independent critic and he said to me that um well partly because i was an independent writer and critic until i took up that job at jnu for 7 years uh, from Uh, which i retired and and i said to him uh, um i'm sorry to speak of you in this way in the third person i'm but i'm still taking the sort of liberty of doing this while introducing you so i said to rustam that, that i suppose those that those years of having been more or less independent mark you out mark out a person uh, and they never become fully professionalized and and there is a kind of uh characteristic that that person has and i i would say this is true of me as well because until i took up a job teaching at the university of east anglia um in 2006 i never had a job i mean i was a writer from the time i finished my phd in 1993 that and finished my second novel that year until 2006 13 years so um we 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 are people i suppose who are uh who are never really going to be pinned down to their institutions and departments and that that may not be a bad thing um for the department either uh to have a few people like them around uh or us around um we as it happens are sitting in uh separate uh, rooms in the same house right now Uh, i had planned to do this uh, at first as a sort of beckettian or beckett play in the uh, address each other through our laptops in the same room but we realized that the leakage in sound would 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 uh, sabotage that project uh, so we have to be content to be in neighboring rooms and i hope there isn't too much leakage coming in from you know each other uh, kind of voices um and so we are in my flat and um where there is a wifi connection we are both uh, sort of connected to and we are going to start now um the the conversation is going to be a conversation i mean it's it's yeah. going to be we are both going to be ruminating on things uh which have have to do with the episodic as the title of the event uh you know uses that word and the reason that that word has been used is because uh, i want to focus on a particular thing which has uh, in- interested me for a very long time as a writer and a reader and something which i also encountered in rustam's um book on uh a book he edited with paula rickman called performing the ramayana tradition which came out uh last year uh, i have to say this is not a book launch so um the, the, those kind of events have run 
their course. I mean, I mean, they have their purpose, but sort of they're a bit of a dead end. We're going to be discussing ideas. Uh, and But it just so happens that one of these ideas is something that I encountered here, and which is of direct interest to me, which has to do with the episodic. Uh, the, the, the word is not uh, one that I'm uh, neither Rustam nor, nor I are completely happy with because the episodic immediately um, connotes a, 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 a totality, a total narrative in which comprised of not uh, maybe onward development, but nevertheless comprising episodes. And here we are not even looking at that totality. We are only looking at ep the part. That's what we are interested in. Um, Rustam, I'm just going to read out a tiny bit from this very, very interesting interview you did about uh, the Ramayana in Kutiyattam. Yeah. Um, and this is an inter interview with two practitioners, right. uh, Margi Madhu Chakyar and Doctor, his wife, Dr. Indu G. Uh, and and uh, I, in fact, I had a chat with uh, Margi uh, Madhu Chakyar and told him that, you know, we're going to be doing this. Uh, Rustam was kind enough to introduce me to him. And, um, and I'm going to read this section out and ask you to respond uh, to a question I might have. So this is towards the beginning of the interview. So you, you ask him about these concepts, character. So we are not starting right away with the episodic, just mm. a little preface uh, to that. You, you ask him about the Malayalam words for character, actor, and narrator. Uh, and also you ask him about these concepts because they are concepts. Uh, and he replies in Malayalam, uh, uh, please forgive my pronunciation. I may get, get the words wrong. In Malayalam, we refer to the character as Katha Patram, where Katha means story and Patram means person. For actor, we use the standard vocabulary of Natan and Nati. Right. I think that even when we are present as a character on stage, the, the narrator, Sutan, right. yeah. is present inside us. Yeah. We are never fully in character. I found, find this a fascinating statement, Yes. Uh, a very self-reflexive and, and pointed statement. Yeah, okay. So you say, you, your question in response to that, so would you say that every character has an inbuilt narrator? And then Madhu Margi says, yes, that used to be the case for traditional styles of acting mm -hmm. in earlier times, that mm -hmm. we all had an inbuilt mm -hmm. narrator. Mm -hmm. Today, as performances of Kutiyattam are becoming shorter, mm -hmm. Uh, we are imbibing concepts of Western theater, and that's why we see the character becoming a dominant figure on the stage. It has now become the norm. But keep in mind that when Ravan, for instance, gets down from the chariot, it is the actor narrator who places the stool in the appropriate place and sits on it. Mm -hmm. This person is not Madhu, that is himself, or Ravan. So, it goes on in this fascinating way. What I also find fascinating is his own um, very pointed remarks and the positions that he's taking. Yes. And he's taking these positions at, a, 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 at the confluence of being both a practitioner and somebody who's thinking about their practice and how it's changing and the, um, the impact of that change on his practice and the way you think of that practice and the subconscious uh, ways in which one might accept the change or not accept them. And finally, um, what I'm also fascinated by is his standing also at the crossroads of what, what might be called Kudiyattam and what he calls Western theater. Yes. Uh, and so we reserve this position at the crossroads nowadays for, pe for people like ourselves. By ourselves, mm -hmm. I mean Anglophone Right. Uh, an Anglophone class, but not only do we know from reading, you know, uh, uh, literary traditions in the modern Indian languages that that crossroads was occupied uh, by by artists and writers in those traditions, but even in a seemingly 
um, more traditional classical form, uh, which also we associate more with performance than with thought. Mm. One can make such a crude binary on behalf of the person I'm uh, sort of second guessing as to the, you know, the, the people who create those binaries. We find actually this binary doesn't hold. I mean, here are these people who are far more productively at this crossroads between thought and performance yes. between traditions. Yes. I, I would, I wonder what your thoughts are. Well, you've said so many things, Amit, and thank you for inviting me for this conversation. Uh, there's a lot packed in what you said. Um, so um, let me just say that um, those of us who grew up with modern ways of thinking about theater and doing theater for the longest time had no clue about what was happening in the rest of the country in rural areas. Uh, in dealing with traditions like Kuriyatam, Kathakali, Krishnatam, Tayyam, uh, I could go on and on. The book that you mentioned has something like 14 traditions. And we run a certain kind of arrogance in believing that we alone are reflexive and we alone have a certain kind of prerogative to interpreting the contemporary. This is nonsense that if you really engage with these performance traditions at ground levels, you would realize that these performers are highly reflexive, you know, about what they are doing on the stage. So there's a, a to get back to your, there's a lot of thought in what they're doing, right? And they are on the cusp, as it were, of honoring their own paramparas, their legacies, which have been passed down to them over a long, long, long period of time with changes and also having to engage with new thoughts that are circulating in the public sphere. Okay, so um, it's very significant that uh, Madhu, as I call him, and Indu, his wife, they yes. run Nepathya and Nepathya has come into the limelight for many reasons, not least because they honor a legacy that has been passed down to them by one of the greatest gurus of Kuriyatan, Amanur Madhavachakya. Okay, so that's what they are continuing. But with that, there has been an infusion, you might say, of a certain kind of academic reflexivity, which is coming from the great scholar and seer, uh, Sarudaya Rasika David Shulman. So for the last 10 years or so, David has been bringing his students uh, from uh, Hebrew University to uh, this particular center where 10 nights, 10 to 12 nights of Kuriyatam are watched with what David would call deep seeing, you know? So there's an intersection that takes place which has been extremely productive, but it also uh, sometimes creates other kinds of creative problems. So I'll try and unpack some of this, okay? Now, uh, what makes uh, Kuriyatam very contemporary for me as a performance tradition is that it's, um, it, it, it negotiates these three components that you've talked about. It seems very simple. The actor, the character, the narrator, okay? There is never a total becoming into the character, never, okay? There is always a coming out of the character. And this, I think, is something very distinctively Indian, you know, the, and you bring it up a lot in your own writings on music. When you're dealing with Shruti, for example, the state of becoming that never fully becomes, right? Okay, so that is, so if you see, for example, my mind is taking me to a great performer from a different tradition, Guru Kelucharan Mahapatra, uh, in the ODC tradition. If one had the privilege of seeing Guru Kelucharan Mahapatra play Radha, you know, there are so many states of becoming and I would say unbecoming. It's like a, it's moving and then it's, it's moving back. It's not as in Stanislavski, I'm jumping a bit. Yes. In Stanislavski, the whole point of transformation is that you become the character and you remain in character. In fact, we make a joke of it even when you're taking the curtain call. Mm -hmm. So when you're taking the curtain call, when you're expected to be yourself, no, the beauty of the Moscow Art Theatre was they took the curtain call in character, you know? This is not the case in Kudiyatam, which is more provisional, which is more mutant, 
and which is moving in and out. Okay, so there is a highly self-conscious mode of performance here, which is what a lot of avant-garde performance is all about today in different ways for irony and so on and so forth, you know. Now, where do you think the problems come in? See now, uh, in Kuriyatam, as you know, this is so intriguing. It's not an innovation, it's a convention, okay? For us, it may seem like an innovation. So it's the tradition. And what is the tradition? Kuriyatam always focuses on one act, you know? I'm not talking of one act play, I'm talking of one act in a multi-act play, okay? And that one act will last 21 nights or whatever. Today it's become a little shorter because of all kinds of constraints of 10 to 12 nights. Okay. So, so it's Rustam, not one act. It, yes. You you you've you've so now segued into the the <laughs> kind of subject of advertise for this talk. Okay. Right? I mean, you you are now moving towards the one act or the episode. Yes. Yeah. So can I just interrupt you for a second before sure. you, you make that right. segue uh, from, you know, this self-reflexivity, yes. uh, this never being fully in character. Yes. Uh, which, by the way, I mean, I, I find that the, 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 the distinctions between conventional, uh, traditional and avant-garde uh, collapse in somebody yes absolutely. Uh, like Margi when when he yeah. speaks because he's speaking with a, a, a very pointed uh, sort of sense of what western theater entails he's critiquing some of it yes. uh, in the sense of you know this mm. assumption that there will be a total mm. identification by the actor mm -hmm. with the character they're playing, um, and and uh, the, the 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 roots through which we think that Indian theatre uh, either becomes westernized through proscenium a realistic theatre, or it becomes westernized through modernism and and the avant garde. Uh, and on the other hand, we have classical theater or we have a kind of realist Indian theater, which began whenever in the 19th century. None of those hold. Yes. None of, so because, because here is a person who's referring to their own tradition, uh, but in a very critical uh, intervention. They're, they're not referring to it for, it's purely for the sake of authenticity or being true oh. to, to that authenticity. So they're, they're aware of the the, the 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 angularity of what that tradition represents in a kind of climate where people have very different ideas about character theater reality right. now, now before uh, we segue into uh, this this bit mm. about the episode i'm going to read out again from your interview uh, with uh, madhu uh, margi madhu um, Just give me a second. Uh, we don't. We, I, I find he's his um, many of his comments uh, interesting. Uh, we don't study plays like a Sanskrit scholar. He yeah, makes that distinction yeah, over there. Yeah. And then, uh, mm -hmm. then uh, how did the publication? You ask him. You ask them mm -hmm. uh, of Bhasa's plays mm -hmm. affect the performance of Kudiyattam. Yeah. And then he says, up until the 10th or 11th year of being at Margi, I did not know about Bhasa. Am I pronouncing it correctly? Right, absolutely. Bhasa. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So the first time I learned about him was while attending K.N. Panikar's Bhasa Festival in 1987. Right. He asked me to recite a shloka from yes. Torana Yuddham. Yeah. Uh, people heard that shloka and I was told that it is to be found in Bhasa's play. Um, I was not aware of this until that moment. Now, you say, now as seniors performers in your own right, do you read Shakti Bhadra seven act play as an entity? So this ties in with what you were just getting into. Yes, exactly. Uh, and then he says, no, not at all. Even now we read the individual acts of Shakti Bhadra's play as yes. separate plays in their own right. Yes. Separate plays in their own right. Yes. But do you find it difficult to read all the acts sequentially in the form of one single play? You ask mm, him. I ask wonderful, him. wonderful question. And then he says, no, the problem is that when you conceive it as a full play, you are bound by the development of the character yes, exactly. according to the plot of the play. Yeah. The, subtleties, the subtleties that can be explored by examining the character in just one act 
are lost. This is wonderful, and it's for me as the kind of writer I am. Yes, I know. <laughs> uh, and 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 this is why I had this idea. Of this is a, what I would call a, a kind of affinity. These are the affinities that we can strike. One Sanskrit scholar has spoken in comparative studies of provisional universals. I would rather avoid the language of universals, and I would just speak the language of cultural affinities. You know, like creative affinities. You know, this that's, is, that's, that's, a, that's a better way. Yeah, of not universal. You know, you know. Yeah. No, I'm fascinated by it, and as I say, it's a convention. You just do one act. That one act takes about twenty-one days to be performed. Now, just let's pause over here and just try and translate it in very, very basic terms. Today, in the modern theater, let's say Ian McKellen is doing the storm scene from later. Okay, and that's it. Nothing else, just storm. You know, we could- Is he actually time. doing that? Is no, that no, 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 exactly. no. He would never do it. That's, that's you know, yeah. That would yeah. never happen. Yes. Uh, the problem is that, uh, would he be able to sustain it for three hours? Let's forget 21 days, but you know, can he just do that scene? And uh, the chance is no, because there's no training for that particular kind of, to use one of your favorite words, improvisation, but coming with a lot of rigor and a lot of, you know, convention. Mm -hmm. But the audience would feel very cheated. Mm -hmm. You see, when you go and see Lear, it's not just for the storm scene. You want to see how the old man dies at the end of the fifth act. Yeah. And the test of the actor in the Western tradition is to say, how do you sustain it? How do you find the breath? So one very important consideration in theater would be, where do you position the storm scene before the intermission or after the intermission? You know, right. that kind of stuff. Yes. Now, we don't work like this at all. And he's absolutely correct. It's surprising, uh, uh, you know, Amit as a writer, they don't know, always knew the names of the authors, you know? So for the longest time, this is most intriguing. Could he have them actors were performing plays, that's individual acts of other plays without knowing the name of the author, but each of the acts is named as a play in its own right, okay? Mm -hmm. So act six of Shakti Bhadra's Ashcharya Chudamani would be Anguli Yanka, the, the, the act of the ring. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's just the act where Hanuman finds uh, Sita in, in the Ashoka Grove and gives the ring and she gives him an ornament, the Chudamani, back mm -hmm. to him as a kind of, that's it, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, you're quite right when you use the word episode. Episode is what exists within acts, okay? I would say there's an act, Within the act, there are episodes. Within episodes, there are sequences. And if you really pushed it far enough, there is the moment. Mm -hmm. So what you are playing actually is that one moment, you know, or several moments. And you're playing it with an incredible density and sense of individual kind of detail, you know. Yeah. That yeah. is what makes it... Uh, so now uh, you might say when I asked him those questions, I'm glad you read it. I, I asked very prosaic questions as, as you realize. I wanted to get to the point as what do you as an actor really do? So obviously he knows all the seven acts of Ashcharya Chodhavani, that's the taken for granted. But when he is performing it, hmm. he can't get to the seventh act when he is playing the third act or the fifth act. Yes. That's, that's the focus and it's all right to do that. You know? yeah. Yes. So, no, I, I think that's maybe what he meant when he said, I don't read the play as a Sanskrit scholar would read the no, play. No, uh, no. Um, and yeah, this, th this is fascinating to me because uh, I, I myself as a writer and a reader am interested in, uh, more in paragraphs. than yeah. in, I'm not even interested in the entire chapter. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in paragraphs as units um, yes. and and i'm i'm moved by the fact that he says you know if you get too sort of concerned with the development of the yes. entire thing yes. which is something he critiques earlier as well when he says you we need to have some sort of distance from the character otherwise yes. it becomes Absolutely. driven. No, you must be distant you yeah. this, it's a con you know it's it's distance and immersion it's two yeah. things which in our mind tends yeah. to be seen as a binary Yes. But they have a certain kind of fluidity 
in moving into immersion, you know, like where you absolutely one, you are one with that character and, and then you pull out of it and you become a narrator. And as a, as a writer, I'd just like you to point out just getting into the more verbal aspects of Puriyatam, there is something called syntactic suspense. Okay, this is David Shulman's uh, category. And so in addition to the gestures and the movement, there's also the bachika, the movement. Now the line, when you say you want paragraphs, you know, what about the line? Yes. So in Kuriyatam, the line is never spoken, you know, let's say at the beginning of an episode or at the end, in its entirety. It could just be two words. Yes. Now then, or whatever. And yes. then you will have to wait. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's quite amazing for another eight nights before that sentence will be completed. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. So there is this kind of, uh, you leave meaning in suspension. Yeah. You know, you, you don't fill it up. You yeah. don't get to the point. And there again, I will come to a very simple example for many of our audience members, some of whom could be students. And I'd ask you to think, what if an actor comes on stage and says, is this, is this, is this, because they go on repeating this. And then eight, maybe nights later, it's, is this a dagger which I see before me, the handle towards my hand. Right, the right. full line will not be given. So there yes. is a kind of suspension, which I think is one of the things you try to explore in your own writings, because you never completely fill out, you know, the, the line. Yes. Um, I'll, I'll respond to that very quickly in relationship to writing, but also in relationship to music, um, mm -hmm. especially khayal. You know, the khayal sometimes can have uh, words which are similar to the words uh, of a devotional song, you know. Hari ke charana kamala, the words of a famous composition in Rag Shri. Mm -hmm. you know? But again, you know, as the person begins to meditate on Shri, and uh, this is in Jhaptal, and begins to sing uh, this rag, uh, I mean, he or she might. Uh, be, when they land on um, when they land on the sum that is the yes. one of the ten beat cycle, they uh, and the word hari lands on sum, they will just say her. Yeah, and then if they want to, they'll continue with re. Wow. wow. Uh, at that point, they're only concerned. So the word has suddenly become loosened from uh, referential. Right. It's you know, a sound. It's a sound. Yeah. And no less uh, um, uh, powerful for being a sound when, it, when, uh, when they say, absolutely. Huh, huh, you know, absolutely. so, so I, that came to me as you were talking about, you know, this is, or, or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and what is it, uh, you know, not completing that. But I'm just going to read out a few um, sentences from a paragraph by uh, V.S. Naipaul, um, where in House for Mr. Biswas, he's talking about how Biswas in his early days uh, takes on jobs. He's a bus conductor. Then he becomes a, you know, uh, um, a sign painter. And of yes. course, he's at a slight distance from the English language. You know, he picked it up when he did, you know, and now he's a painter of signs. And so one of the things that he pr produces as a sign painter, uh, he's asked to do is produce a sign called Idlers Keep Out by Order. <laughs> this is in Trinidad, as you know. Yeah. So now uh, the narrator says his hand became surer, his strokes bolder, his feeling for letters finer. Mm -hmm. He thought R and S the most beautiful of Roman letters. No letter could express so many moods as R mm -hmm. without losing its beauty. And what could compare with the swing and rhythm of S? Wow. With a brush, large letters were easier than small. And that this continues. It's a bit longer, this paragraph. I remember reading Naipaul first through this quote, uh, quoted in an essay. And I thought I could stay with this quote for a long time. Yes. And now in the, connect, in the context yes. of Kudiyatam, I see uh, dance-like performance yes. also being invoked over here in the... In the a description of the movement of the letters. But I, I, I'm also reminded of the word that uh, Margi Madhu used that, you know, the subtlety of that act, 
gets lost if we think about yeah, the long, the the, the long yeah. so here too i i felt i remember thinking at the age of whatever it was 23 or 22 mm. that it's a shame that i'll have to read the entire novel you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to be with this with this paragraph. Yeah, you know why that is, and this ties up with this with the line as well. Uh -huh. Paragraph, line, act. I think, or as we as is the case with Kathak dance episode from Mahabharat. Let's say yeah. even episodes that become cliches like the rape of Draupadi, uh, or 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 a episode from Bhagavad Purana. The the the, the, you know, the, the, Any the of women, women who are being harassed by the child Krishna, their, right. their clothes are being, right. yeah, that, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's quite unique that only those moments are focused on again and again. Mm -hmm. um, but what is true of all these is, is the fact that, and what was true of, you know, reading that paragraph is I could supply or imagine the novel in an inchoate way, but in a very powerful way through that paragraph in a way that would be, I felt somehow reduced if I read the novel, something opened up, you know? So, and, and that happens to me again and again, even when I see the cover of a book, you know, mm. the, the, or, or the title, a title I really like, something opening up, which gets reduced once you actually tie yourself to the syntax of yes. a recounting. So I think uh, one yeah. thing that's coming to mind is the role of the imagination, that yeah. when things get written out, uh, completely written for you, then what room is there in your imagination to allow it to mutate and grow in your own way or not mutate and grow? And I think to have a gap or a blank or a suspension, which is what we're talking, enables you to imagine more deeply, I would say. You yeah. have to do quite a bit of work. Imagine, uh, uh, for, for me, but also for the reader. reader for, and, in the yeah, case absolutely. of the Kudiatum dancer, I'm presuming that uh, at least for the, the episodes that I was talking about mm. in relationship to Kathak dance, mm. people know the rest of the story. Yes, yes. You know, yes. so, but, but what they are encountering is a bit from which their imaginations too begin Absolutely. to work in different directions yes. as to what, you know, what world that, that particular episode might belong to. It's not reduced by us already giving it to them. No, I'd like to uh, bring into the discussion the role of the performer as writer. Yes. Because uh, the most significant, you might say, section of any Kudiyatta performance is the Nirvahanam. And the Nirvahanam could be called the actor's improvisation that goes on for many, many, many nights on end. And it's basically a very detailed and sustained retrospect of that character's life. So instead of going forwards, you know, this is an incredible thing. And I have, there's no precedent for it that I'm aware of. The actor retraces the inner life of the character through a journey that goes backward, maybe to the moment of birth, maybe to another birth, maybe to the origins of creation or whatever. Time is very flexible. Mm -hmm. And at some point when the actor has had enough, it's the actor who makes the choice. This is not coming from the, from the playwright at all. It's the actors, it's the performance text. Mm -hmm. This is something that's very important to me because we don't often realize that performers are creating their own texts on stage. Yes. And these yes. are very detailed texts because yes. they draw on many illusions. It could be references from other acts of the play. It could be from the larger canvas of mythology or whatever. You know yes. how amazing uh, uh, time is very fluid in this kind of absorption, but it's basically the actor's journey to a certain point in time where the action of the play is such as completely suspended. There's yeah. no action as such. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. an inner journey. Yes, yes. I, I feel this is true of the Gita as well. It's one of the earliest texts in which a narrative is interrupt, interrupted. That is the Mahabharata, yes. the story of the Mahabharata. And yeah. we enter a state of stasis. Yes, yes. Um, yes. What, do you, what, what are your fe feelings about the quotation? 
since we're connecting it to various things, yeah. what Margi Madhu has said yeah. you know, about the act yeah. and the subtlety uh, of immersing oneself yeah. in the act itself rather than, than the entire oh, yeah. the whole narrative. What do you think, do you have any thoughts on the, on the quotation as a feature of yes. art, writing? Yes, I do. And it's not going to come from Kudiyatam, but from Bertolt yeah. Brecht, yeah. an epic theater. Yes. So Bertolt Brecht is probably the strongest theorist we have who actually challenged this idea of continuity and getting to the end, even mm. though his plays do have ends. Mm. And he did this through many extraordinary ways by basically, in his word, interrupting the play. So we're not talking of suspension. It's actually a break, you know. Mm. So Mother Courage has bargained, you know, for her son. She's, uh, and she's taken too long to bargain. Her son is killed. And the, the soldiers bring in the dead body of the son and say, do you know who this is? And she shrugs her shoulders and said, never seen him in my life. And he's taken out. And then she opens her mouth in a silent scream. The guest was. This is a kind of quotation, as it were. It's a kind of, you know, it, it stands by itself, you know. Yeah. And uh, so, in a sense, you might ask, where does this come from? I'm just throwing out the references because I know you want to talk about cinema in a different mode. This is actually coming from Eisenstein. It's coming from montage, you know, mm -hmm. where one moment, yeah. one gesture is taken out, you know, and, and in a sense, the rest of the play stops, the action stops, you know, it's not yeah. dramatic. It's mm. there for me to get back to your first thing, thought. Yes. For you to think, yes. not necessarily without emotion. That's always been a, a, a debatable point, you know, that, so yeah. whenever you have a quotation, this comes up in Benjamin a lot, you know, Benjamin loved quotations, yes. you know, and, uh, and Brett ha has a different kind of take on it. I think that in, in, in Kuriyatam, the quotations are coming from already existing sources, literary sources, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not necessarily operating in the context of gestures, you know, mm -hmm. where the gesture becomes a kind of quotation. But that's one kind of uh, thought that I have in mind. Yes. Know, yeah. Talking of quotations. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm going towards these sort of, um, you know, uh, themes like like quotation uh, uh, as a kind of natural corollary of of your interview with with yes. uh, Margi Madhu and and uh, and because I also um, told you about the impact that the quote from Naipaul had on me and yes. it's uh, it's only a a particular kind of mindset we that we are naturalized in that tells us that the quotation is not enough. However, it's however yes. it might be it's part of something else. Uh, but then, then I think to myself, on what level does uh, the quotation work and in, in different sort of contexts, how do quotes work? How do quotations work? So the one way of a quotation um, being used is in an academic uh, text where it is used to buttress an argument and you have a footnote as right. well. Right. Uh, in an essay, a, a quote might be a moment of association and distraction. If the, you know, the person is talking about right. something, it reminds him of something else, and he quotes of another text, he quotes or she quotes from it. Right. And, and the essay may not be footnoted, so it, it remains a possibility that the quote we, for the reader, we do not know where exactly necessarily yeah. is from. Mm. The, the other thing is, like when you quote a line so I'm again going back to uh, uh, Margi Madhu's um, comment about I don't uh, read the the play as a Sanskrit scholar does. So yeah. uh, uh, so when you read a line or when you quote a line from let's say Kalidas, say say Shakuntala, mm -hmm. you know, um, what is it that makes it work? You know what you pick out the line. Mm. Shakuntala. You may or may not know Shakuntala. You know, like you, it may be a case of epic theater. You have, you've seen it a hundred times, or you may not know it. What is it that makes it work? Uh, and so, for me, I, 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 again, I would say that every paragraph is a first paragraph. You know, mm. it has to be a first paragraph, an opening. Mm. You know, mm. not part of a syntax that 
is dependent on our sense of the of its place and uh, in the function it's playing in a progression for us to be able to wholly appreciate it it must also be a fresh beginning yeah. therefore if, wherever we pick it out from it yeah. should be able to stand because it will, it suggests a direction forward and it may suggest a past yeah. but it is a beginning you know and and similarly for a line from a from a kalidas play i think also is simultaneously part of a progression that is leading towards mm. you know, it's, the story is unfolding there are other lines to follow but it is also stand alone it can yes. be taken out and it could be part of a play that could have gone elsewhere yes. there's a beautiful uh, moment shared by david shulman in the accompanying interview that i do where he's talking about shakuntala now keep in mind shakuntala is one of the greatest plays sanskrit plays ever etc it's not part of the kudiyattam repertoire right okay and there are all kinds of reasons for that i i won't go into here yeah but only recently in iranyala kuda dai uh, kapila venu one of the great uh, nangyar kutu kudiyattam performers has done a full length shakuntala which is really worth worth seeing but it's a it's a recent addition margi madhu has done i think i'd like to introduce another term here which isn't quite working on the same plane as quotation etc summary yeah all uh, the summary of the text is very important in kuriyatta you know samkshepan as they call it also no kuriyatta performance is possible without what they call an atta prakara which is an actor's manual okay uh-huh. so this actor's manual is not poetic beautiful etc etc it's cryptic mm. and it's condensed because it's not just the word you have to keep that in mind that the language of theater performance is synesthetic so it's gesture it's expression it's abhinaya right yeah. so all of that is notated in a very down to earth kind of manner it's that text that's the real you might say text they return to and as both margi madhu and indu have told me if they have not learned their atta prakaram by heart so there's a kind of memory you can't go anywhere the performance yeah. will it will it will will not take off at all yeah. like on sideline i started talking about it and you had a different question about uh, um i forgot the question that i was responding to and i got this is typical <laughs> yeah no 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 that's no. great i mean i was no. only speaking about you no. know how difficult it is for us sorry to... uh, the shakuntala sorry uh, shakuntala yeah a line okay. from shakuntala all right so yeah. uh, david shares this one moment where he saw just the opening sequence where dushyanta meets shakuntala <laughs> and this was created by margi madhu it's a very famous scene and right. and and shakuntala is with her sakis yes. and then there's a bee that comes and begins to torment her yes. and that's the moment when dushyanta decides to make his entrance like a grand hero and yes. they promptly fall in love there is shringar at first sight okay yes. Yes. now david of course is ultimately in my view a very romantic reader he's very modern reader and yes. he says that moment was so magical why because you could see the whole tragedy unfolding before you in that one moment of intense desire you know where these two are seeing each other for the first time as a spectator he was talking about himself he said you could almost envision yes. where this was going to go you know yeah. now that's a very modern impulse i would say that mm. a, a kind of modern impulse where you don't have to necessarily fill in the dots but you can almost envision this is doomed you know mm. or this is not going to work out mm. i'm not necessarily sure that this is how margi madhu or indu would, would see it that way yes. i think we would not necessarily they would perhaps have a problem with that yes really. yes they would But probably maybe more maybe immersed in that particular in that moment in that moment of shringar and play that alone But how can you stop people from seeing things in narratives you know right. this is the role of the spectator you know as uh, so if somebody chooses in that moment to see an underlayer or a, of of a, of an imminent loss or betrayal yeah. or whatever you know that's another way of reading 
that's another way of reading the True. text. You know, there, 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 there's no harm in having a discussion or an argument or a counterpoint as to ways in which we can read episodes, right. you know, whether it's to do with them predicting right. uh, uh, the, the entirety or mm -hmm. forgetting it. For instance, in Kafka's Metamorphosis, the opening mm -hmm. page and a half, you know, Gregor Samsa wakes up to the fact that they've become an, he's become a giant insect and then forgets about it. <laughs> you know, he, for a page and a half, he is busy with the fact that he hates his job and it's a it's a miserable day and he's going to be late and he'll have to face his manager again wow. and he's thinking how to find a way of leaving that job mm. you know page and a half is devoted by kafka to that alone kafka unlike a lesser writer has forgotten the story has forgotten that he's turned a giant insect mm. a lesser writer would stay with that yes. fact yes yeah right. uh, um so, so, so let's kind of move to a close now, but, but before that, maybe just play a song from a Hindi film from the 60s. So 50s and 60s, I think we move towards, as we, you know, I've discussed this with you, uh, Rustam. So we, uh, we move towards these extraordinary uh, interludes in narrative cinema. And that's how we think of Hindi cinema or any mainstream feature film of, of um, these interruptions of luminosity, where, it, again, it seems that the narrative has been to some on some level forgotten. Right. And the, 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 the word for that is picturization in, in, yes. in, in Indian parlance, you know? Right. Uh, and I wonder what people mean by picture, picturization. It means a certain kind of uh, style uh, of cinematic values brought to that moment when, or those moments in which the song is happening, yes. you know, because a, a different sort of luminosity and a very cinematic luminosity, yeah. very much, uh, very different from the Broadway style enactments of uh, Hollywood musicals begins to take place in the Hindi film um, of the fifties and sixties. Um, unconscious to ourselves, we study those songs, not, and, and we have paradigms and, and contexts through which we've been studying them for decades now through, through um, you know, television programs like Chaya Geet, et cetera, where we look at the song alone, yes. you know? Yeah. And, and we, we might say it's to do with the fact that we, are, we want to listen to the song. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the picturization is a bit of additional material, right. but no, it's an art form. You know, that episode, the song episode yeah. is, an, is an art form, uh, which, which now many of us will find us is returning only to the song as it's shown rather than the film. And some of us have never seen the film, uh, have only seen the song. Yeah. And in the song and its kind of visual um, incarnation, there is much to study and immerse ourselves in. Right. So, uh, um, uh, so unconscious to ourselves, we have picked up a principle not very far from uh, no, the term, yeah. where we are ready to immerse ourselves mm -hmm. in that particular episode alone. Now, this song, Dhire Dhire Machal, a beautiful song in terms of composition, orchestration, arrangement by Hemant Kumar, uh, sung by uh, Lata, but also uh, Rishikesh Mukherjee, the way he captures a particular kind of space, a middle class space in, in, it, in it, makes for me the rest of the film almost redundant. So uh, it, the rest of the film is a bit of a mess. I have not mm. watched it more than once, but I keep returning to the song. Mm. So let's just have a look at the song. Yeah. <laughs>
अधूरा रह जाए तो अच्छा नहीं होता गाओ मुझे बहुत दुख होता है तुमने मैंने अच्छी तरह से गाना सीखा जितना सीखा उतना ही बहुत है मेरे लिए अरुणा उम्मीद से ज्यादा मिल जाए तो ऐसा मालूम होता है जिससे आदमी उसके लायक नहीं मैं बताऊ ऐसी बातें तुमने कहा से सीखी कहा से सीखी सीखी भी नहीं चुराई है मेरी बात से धीरे धीरे मचल है दिले Much as I'd like to hear it uh, and see it to the finish, but uh, it, yeah, what you have there, as as you see, is 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 a song, uh, but also a particular space, um, and very different from say um, the, the the clutter of a of of a Western style drawing room. There are just just a few objects there, the doll, uh, but there's also something from the west the piano uh, which has been sort of domesticated um sh the grill i mean you saw a, a grill in in my drawing room and you uh, you know uh, connected with it with a particular time so i'm content to study i, I mean the, the the visual was a bit jerky over here uh, but be because of the connectivity or whatever but i'm content to study that particular thing uh, this particular song again and again without actually watching the film yeah yeah um, that's uh, i was just thinking uh, to bring it to our times because song picturization as you're aware and as you've written is something that exists between the 50s and the 70s it comes out occasionally the great filmmaker like mani ratnam and roja in a in a in a song like choti si asha which is an extraordinarily i didn't like the film that's an interesting case where i really had serious problems with this film but i can't deny the skills of the the song picturization in the early part of that film and i i can see it on its own terms but if i had to see it in relation to the rest of the film i think it would become very problematic so one uh, some questions that come to my mind we wouldn't encounter such kinds of song picturization today in indian cinema it's absolutely gone okay yep. Yep. and i think there are two reasons for this and i'd like your because it's these are musical uh, uh, considerations i would say the melodic line that it, this uh, is gone and what it has been replaced by is rhythm okay an insistent rhythm and increasingly kind of fast rhythm the other thing that's gone is vilambit kal there's no slow speed anymore it's very difficult to find a slow a uh, hindi film number anymore and maybe madhyam and most of it is really you know insistent and this that beat and that kind of thing so this came about in the 80s i remember talking to bv current who was great uh, uh, theater the music known for his skills in music he goes comes from the company theater tradition of the gubbi virana company so i asked him what do you see changing today who do you think is doing new things in music and he said ar rahman 
I said, why? And he said, rhythm. The rhythm has changed. The rhythm of, of, of the soundscape is no longer, you know, this very fluid, fluid uh, mm. kind of thing. Mm. And I, you really begin to wonder what kind of picturization is possible. And here we can link it to speed, you know, mm. because <laughs> tough, I mean, we do have uh, uh, films where show you, you know, staccato like uh, images but they're not really picturizations it's more like action you know it's sure. not this it's a picturization does compel you to reflect a little bit you know yeah. on uh, yeah. it, it takes you inwards so i think it's it's a different mode you know of uh, i have one uh, just to bring it back to uh, what we were talking about earlier the earliest forms of picturization that we may have in traditional performance is in the shadow puppet tradition. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, in Ravan Chaya, which comes from Orissa, this is one of the most exquisite because it's so pure. It's so utterly pure. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mentioned this in my book. In fact, my introduction ends on this note, except that I haven't theorized it as eloquently as you have. And this has to do with the cessation of action, the suspension of action. So I'm thinking of a sequence from the Ramayana in the Ravanchaya tradition, where all you have is a river and a boat. Mm -hmm. And Ram, Lakshman, and, and Sita cross the river three times. Okay. And that's mm -hmm. all there is in that, if you will, sequence. You know? mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's exquisite. It's Amazing. very hard to say why that absolute, that simple movement Yes. With no, you know, like overlay of text, there's no progression. It yes. gets to the heart. Let's use that language. The heart yeah. of the narrative is right there. You know? Right. Pure. That sounds extraordinary. And um, it's a good moment for us to bring this part of the conversation to an end and open it out to a few questions, if yeah. there are any. Uh, Aditya, would you help us with that um, in case there are any questions? Yeah, professors, we are, actually have three questions. Yes. Um, should I read out them, read them out serially? Uh, do, please, yeah. Yeah. So the first question is by P. Cooper, and they say that they find the, found the conversation fascinating. Um, <clears throat> they have a statement on which they invite your thoughts, which is um, mimesis in double quotes and realism in double quotes. Both of these came to the West and the East much later. Uh, Greek and Roman theater and prologues were self-reflexive. Um, how does this sort of connect to the conversation we were having? They sort of have this statement that they wanted to hear both of you on. Okay. And should we just hear the other two questions in case we want to take I them? I can't go down. I can't seem to uh, raise one second. I'm trying to get the next question. Yeah, I'll listen to the question. I can't see yeah. it. Yeah, um, uh, it's in the chat box, uh, Professor. Yeah, I've, I've opened the chat box, but I can't, uh, okay, you know, let I can't me, scroll. Uh, I can't scroll yeah. the questions. Let me just put it back in the chat box so that it's visible to you. Um, so this is the word-to-word yes. -word question that they sent. I hope it's visible now. I can't. No? I'll listen to your question, yeah. Yeah, if you want, I can repeat it, definitely. Yes, no, I, um, I listened, I heard the question that you gave yeah. us. Sure. Yeah, this is the first question that we have. So should I go on with the other question? Yeah, yeah please. Yeah, just read yeah. out the other two questions and then... Yeah, so the other two questions are by the same anonymous attendee. Um, they say, uh, this might be unrelated, but your discussion reminds me of another street art from Tamil Nadu called Kutu, which yeah. is performed in a similar way as act. Strangely, because these are performed mostly from the actor's memory and that they are passed over through generations, including the characters that they play. Do you think that they, there are written records of the acts in Kuriyattam? Do the actors or the play directors have written instructions or written yes. songs yes. or is it entirely done from memory? Okay. And, and the, the last, second, yeah, yeah the, the last one, which is also by the same person, is... Uh, in continuation with my previous question, is it because these plays are dependent on the actors as much as the play that three art forms are easily lost? Um, they are, they're asking if, it, if all these three art forms are easily lost because these plays are dependent on the actors. And then they also write, I regretted not seeing Kutu. It has been replaced by a dance performance because the troupe has dispersed 
and there are no replacements for much of these actors. Mm. So, uh, 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 Rustam, would you like to take yeah, this? Sure. So there's See, one on the uh, theater. I and, think, uh, yeah. I think um, at Ashoka itself, I don't know if the speaker is, is based in Ashoka University, but Ashoka University students had a great yeah. opportunity to engage with uh, what is called the Katai Kutu tradition, and it's part of the larger Kutu tradition, where P. Raja Gopal, who's from a traditional Kutu family, came, and along with his wife, Hannah de Bruin, who's an extraordinary scholar. Now, yes, there is a, uh, 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 Hannah has this concept of the oral reservoir of uh, the Kutu performance. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge reservoir of any number of performances, texts, but most of all, songs. I mean, this is the most important thing in Kutu. It begins with songs. You know, you never begin with the, 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 the dialogue or whatever, which is often improvised, comes much later, but you have to start with those songs. Now, I would tell the, the speaker of this question that actually, in addition to this oral, uh, rich oral kind of legacy, there are written texts of Kutu. They are very elaborate. And they, uh, you could study uh, a wonderful uh, text by Hannah de Bruin, where she has translated Karna Moksha. And she does an extraordinary job here because it's based on a written text, okay? But she is following the written text as well as what is being performed on, on the stage or in that performance area and including the improvised sections which are not in the text. So whenever you're dealing with traditional performance, we have to be very careful that we don't make too strict a binary between the written and the oral. As A.K. Ramanujan reminded us, they are very deeply uh, intersected. The oral can generate the written, the written can also generate the oral. It works both ways. So I think this, was, this would be my, uh, uh, yes, it is performer driven. And I don't think there's enough academic attention as yet to the role of the performer. This is my problem when I teach uh, traditional theater. Um, you know, uh, let's say we're dealing with uh, Mandodri or whoever, and uh, there's a performance. And the student will come up and tell me the story of Mandodri from one of the many different versions that exist of this narrative, okay? But I'm telling her that is not what is being performed on the stage. It's completely different, okay? There are selections here, there are abbreviations here, there are emphases here. For example, if you take Draupadi, there may be just one gesture where Draupadi is tugging her hair, calling attention to the fact I will not tie up this hair until you know, justice has been done. You know? So it may just be that one. So the performer is creating his or her own text. And this is something that we have to learn how to factor in and take seriously as seriously as indeed as the author's text and see them in dialogue and counterpoint with each other. Great. Uh, Rustam, I just, uh, well, somebody has raised their hand, but before I go to them, uh, um, just to take you back to this question from uh, P. Cooper, um, I was told. Yeah. Um, any thoughts on yeah. this? My, uh, I, I want to add a question to that. Yeah. yeah. Any thoughts on this? My Mises and Realism came to the uh, to both west and east much later and so greek greek and roman theater in prologues was self reflexive no uh, and and so i what i'd like to add uh, uh, the questions i'd like to ask so when when did this mimesis come in to western theater to eastern theater as this person puts it and um, also uh, two other things i mean mimesis comes to um, greece with classical uh, yeah, sculpture yeah. and art very early, right? I mean, the, it may yeah. not be to theater, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, mm. but, uh, but uh, you know, in contrast to um, sculpture and art forms in other cultures, which, which, which don't want much to do with mimesis. I'm right. seeing this as a decision. Mm. It comes to uh, Greece uh, in, in terms of classicism very early as an ambition, mimesis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, uh, uh, and uh, the, the, the last thing I want to ask you is, and yet we do not have, as I 
we were talking about earlier, uh, even before this uh, event, we, we do not have, and this may, not, may or may not be related to mimesis, we do, not, we do not have people producing an act from Shakespeare, you know? Uh, we still don't have a production that we go to where, you know, Macbeth, the first act, no, is, that is, doesn't that, exist. That doesn't happen. Oh. So in a sense, even now with everything that has happened with mm -hmm. the disruptions of the avant-garde, we still don't want to see a disruption to the totality of the play. No, absolutely. Uh, in like in the West, yeah. 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 See, a great uh, director like Robert Wilson uh, in the West, who is known for long duration performances, uh, extraordinary works like Einstein on the beach, where he's challenging different concepts of time, etc. But there is still a sense of completion Right. He's worked it all out. There's a there's a full, you know, kind of spectacle in front of you. So, yes, I would say as yet, to the best of my knowledge, no one actually works in, in the way that we have been uh, improvising uh, together, uh, where you just have one episode, whether it, it in your example of song pictureization on Kudiyatam, the one act. No, that is not because with that comes a certain knowledge of what do you do with that one act, you know? I mean, it's not a simple, uh, you know, any improv improvisation requires considerable skills. It's not just a matter of doing whatever you want. We know that no improvisation. And, and it also requires an assumption on the part of the performer that the, the people in the audience know that yes, act. Yes, they do. They and do. they want to see how I'm riffing on it. Yes, right? absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so what would be the point then of replication? Just even if replication were possible, that you take the text and you re reproduce it, which is, I'm afraid, an assumption that is often still assumed uh, in, the, uh, in the act. It doesn't happen. You know. Do you want to address this uh, question about when, when this mimesis happens? Mimesis uh, you know, is among the many uh, uh, theories of rasa that exist uh, in the huge centuries-long discourse on rasa. Mimesis as mimesis does not exist, but imitation, anukrama, is very much part of one of the arguments that is put forward. I see. But it is imitation through inference. Okay, okay. Yep. It's an inferential uh, kind of process of imitation. What do you mean? Uh, it's like, it's not a literal, if you see a horse, painting of a horse, it's not a literal horse. Yes. You know? But it, it, it suggests a horse. So it, it's gestures, synecdoches. Gestures, yeah. But something like that did exist very much in the centuries-long discourse around Rasa, which was ultimately debunked by Abhinav Gupta as not being sufficiently subtle enough. You know, yes. so he worked towards something like a depersonalization or a yes. transpersonalization that in actions, I won't go into all no, of no, that. These intellectual histories are amazing. I mean, yeah. they are very important. It's extraordinary. It's yeah. extraordinary yeah. how one concept mutated mm -hmm. over centuries, you know, and it's, it's just with tiny little inflections with, and with deep acknowledgements of earlier contributions. There's a lot of etiquette here. Mm -hmm. Abhinav Gupta never debunks, even though he has a different theory based on what he calls Sadharani Karana, which is not based on imitation, but on some other kind of uh, depersonalized emotion that is uh, co-created between actor and spectator, etc. You know, yeah. uh, but he never debunks what preceded him. You okay. know, it, did, it didn't happen. Fantastic. I mean, um, Dobby, somebody called Dobby raised a hand and uh, also David Liu uh, has a question. Uh, I don't know if Dobby still wants to ask a question. Um, Dobby raised a hand. It says, um, how do we get Dobby's question across? And then David Liu, and then we will bring this to an end. Um, what is Dobby's yeah, question? We can allow Dobby to talk. I'll yeah, Dobby, talk. yeah. Go ahead. Dobby, yes. would you like to speak? Uh, hello. 
Hi, Hi Rastam. Uh, I asked that question about uh, Kutu. I just loved your answer. Thank you so much. Um, again, I'd like to go back to, since that is the art form I grew up watching, um, so I sort of want to base my question on that. Although sure. I think it's still applicable to um, the art form you're talking about. Um, I saw uh, my first uh, glimpse into Kutu was when I was about five years old. And in my mind, the Sita, that whenever I read Sita, it's still that actor that who played Sita. And to actually perform Kutu, you also had to have this, um, this sort of loud voice so that you could reach across yes. you know, the audience. It's because yes. nobody has a mic when they do right, Kutu. Right. And literally, their voice haunts you when you go to bed at night because that's how beautiful and powerful their voice is. Of. And do you think uh, in those days, I'm talking about the 80s, 90s. Do you think those days uh, these traditional art forms were one of the ways that sort of um, unpacked these great epics and made it reach larger audiences? Yes. Considering not many had the liberty to get educated because right. I remember many of them um, knowing Mahabharata and Ramayana only via Kutu, not via yes, textbook. Even I myself did not learn about these until I right. grew much older. So that would be my question. And, and if that is the case, why are we not um, sort of encouraging this tradition? And why are these artists sort of yeah. abandoned, if that is the right yeah. word to use? See, um, thank so, you. Uh, it's um, so Rustam, yeah. Rustam, Rustam yeah. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Let's also take the other question and then you can take them both because then we if will. I'll, I might forget. I, I have a problem with Remembering to yeah, just uh, no, I have a problem. What did you answer? Yeah, then we we'll okay, take the next uh, yeah. You know, Dobby, the it's it's kind of sad that we have these extraordinarily rich traditions, which are conceptually rich, which are so rich in their histrionic power, but they have now. Do they have restricted audiences? If you talk to Hannah the Bruin, she's always regretting the fact that her group on Kataykut Sangam hardly gets any sponsorship from the cities, not from Chennai, not much. But she has a huge audience in rural areas. So for Kutu today, even now, there's a massive audience. They book performances literally months on end. They do it very professionally with a lot of etiquette. So I would answer that way. I would say, yes, these are sources of education. So the way Karna is represented in the Kutu tradition is magnanimity, his generosity, you know, it means a lot to that audience. It's not just a figure from the Mahabharat. He's one of them. He's what they should be, you know. So it's their, their learning experiences, their learning processes. It's the best way to learn the epic. And let me tell you, these, uh, these spectators across the spectrum, they may not have read the epics, but my God, they think the epics. And they can see how the actor is shifting the character and they can be very critical in their own right. And therefore, I think the simple notion of theory cannot just be restricted to a group of scholars who do theory as many of us do. I think theory can also exist in more organic ways, you know, in, in dialogical way. That would be my answer. Yeah. Right. Thanks, uh, um, Rustam. Just, I'm just going to read out David Liu's uh, sure. question, unless you can see it. But um, anyway, I'll, let me read the author act. And it's a kind of further sort of modulation on the yeah. earlier point um, made by Cooper, P. Cooper, um, um, the, the author actor co-creation in Kodiatum performance is similar to ancient Greek drama whose preserved texts were all actors, personal scripts with their own take, their own variations, tropes, etc. They were more like Baroque or classical music of modernity where the text was the basis of personalization and never a complete and exclusive map of performance. In fact, the dra dramatists themselves never adhered exactly to any oral tradition, but felt free to rewrite what they heard. Thus, mimesis in the modern sense of exact representation is a modern invention driven by mass production. It's an extraordinary statement and insight, I would say. There's so much to unpack out here. David, thank you very much for these insights. Um, I think it's one would need to learn so much more about how Greek drama, the so-called text, which we you know, study in class and we think Sophocles, Aeschylus, you know, but we also tend to forget that somebody like Aeschylus, they were also like choreographers, you know, 
they were also dance masters. They also trained the chorus, you know. And I'm afraid that uh, we've lost the, that kind of uh, psychophysical uh, dimensionality of writing, which went with, you know, writing the tragedies as we read them today in the class, you know, which is read them like written texts, right? But actually they were danced, they were sung, they were chanted, you know. And I imagine in that process, as you so correctly point out, that actors' personal scripts with their own take, wow, I've never studied this. I have more knowledge of this in the Elizabethan theater, where, as you know, yeah. great scholars like Tiffany Stern, you know, would tell you in her, one of the very simple great books from, it's not from page to stage, but it's from stage to page. You know, she reverses the dynamic. And so whatever is happening in the rehearsal room on that stage ultimately uh, gets written down and that's what is being passed on. But unfortunately, the way we study text, it tends to be very frozen and we don't always take into account the processes that go into the making of any text. And I think this is a pedagogical challenge across cultures and traditions. And it's a, mo it's a mode of uh, post-romantic uh, kind of approaches yeah. Yes. To, to literature performance. And, and David Liu adds, yes, the dram dramatists were all working dramaturgs. Thank you. Thank um, you. Uh, and, Thank uh, and, you. And, 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 you know, I mean, before yeah. we, I mean, uh, but what we are calling mimesis or, uh, or a, a kind of ordering of our sense of the real and oh. something else we are opposing against it, which breaks that up, whether it's into lines or, or quotations or episodes or acts. Um, I mean, need not only happen in this literal sense of, um, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the mode of production and performance and how closely it corresponds, let's say, to reality uh, or representing reality. Uh, uh, and, and so, you know, as you know, uh, uh, the Nietzsche, in, the young Nietzsche in uh, the birth of tragedy uh, breaks up um, Greek right. tragedy into what's, what he calls very early Greek tragedy, which he calls Dionysiac. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is um, Sophocles yeah. and his contemporaries. And later early Greek tragedy, that is Euripides, into an overdetermined Socratic mindset. Mm. If something dies there, it's not quite Apollinian, that is yes. ordered, mimetic, yeah. but something else is happening. A transition is taking place there in Greece, in yes. ancient Greece itself, yes. according to uh, the young Nietzsche, which separates what's happening in early tragedy from, from the slightly later uh, contemporaneous with Socrates. He, he doesn't like Socrates. <laughs> <laughs> and what he doesn't like is a a particular yeah. kind of overdetermined yeah. way of thinking about various things, including representation and reality, I suppose, mm -hmm. you know, and Socrates has that, you know, Plato has that. I, I, and and he's, he's, he's kind of reacting against it uh, and, but creating a division within Greek tragedy itself in order to mm -hmm. lose. So his dichotomy is not East and West. Yeah. or modern and ancient. His, his dichotomy is within that tradition yeah. itself. And, and one of the ways of looking at that might include our discussion on mimesis, you know, whether it, what he's saying had led to a way of thinking that was mimetic, you know, uh, rather than mimesis in a in, in the more obvious sense. Yeah. And whether the earliest tragedy, which he uh, calls Dionysiac, uh, disrupted this, this, this kind of instinct towards the mimetic. Um, anyway, listen, um, this has been wonderful and it's been a wonderful beginning for us uh, here you know, at Ashoka and the Center for the Creative and Critical to have this chat, for me to have this chat with you. Uh, um, it was lovely, and it came. The chat, the idea of the chat, came out of your interview and your book. Uh, you. So, so thank you for that. And uh, we will continue on these lines in future conversations with people. Hopefully, among them will be will be uh, Margi Madhu, who yes. might bring to Ashoka. Uh, and have him both kind of perform and speak. That would be wonderful. But thank you again, Rustam. Thank you. Very rich kind of vein that you've 
tapped or opened up. Bye to all of you uh -huh. for being here.